Uh, Eric Dye here with the first ever Church Mag Foundry with Kenny Zhang and Sam. Oh my gosh, Sam. Arthur. <laughs> I almost called you Sam Wise. You know what? There's a guy here that does call me Sam Wise, so that's all right. <laughs> <laughs> so we're, we're pretty excited with this first foundry. We're not sure what it's going to look like uh, when everything's said and done, but essentially... Sam had a question about his website, and Kenny is awesome at this kind of stuff. And so I just want to, I want to just let, just turn Kenny go with, uh, with you here, Sam, and just the rest of us can kind of, you know, look over your shoulder and see what kind of insights we can glean. Go for it, Kenny. Great. So Sam, it's great to meet you. I uh, really appreciate your willingness to be a guinea pig here today. Um, hope we'll have some fun and maybe something useful you'll get out of it today. So um, welcome. Thank you for your time. Man. I appreciate it, um, guys. <laughs> so first, why don't you tell us a little bit about your ministry over at Second Baptist, uh, where you're located, a little bit about you know what what's the nature and culture of your church and uh, what your role is there. Okay. Yeah. Um, like you said, my name's Sam Arthur, and I go, or actually, I'm the director of technology at uh, Second Baptist Church in Springfield, Missouri. We've got about four thousand to forty-three hundred people. Um, we are right in the heart of the Ozarks, which basically we've got colleges here. I think we've got a total of like seven or eight colleges here. So um, during the college season, you know, our we have an influx of students. Um, we've got, I mean, it's beautiful here year-round. Um, so we've got a mixture of people in our church. We have a two, two different styles, our contemporary and then more of a traditional style. So we have to try to meet those two, which is a little difficult. Um, and they actually do uh, simultaneous uh, worship services at the same time, um, twice on Sundays at 9.30 and 11 o'clock. So um, there's a big demographic here that we're trying to meet. Um, we are a mission-based church. Um, everything we do has purpose and meaning. Um, we, you know, like the Bible says, we reach here and in the neighborhood of where we live, and then we go out to the city, and then we go out to the county, and then the state, and the United States, and the world. So our, our, our focus is missional. Um, what else? Well, have you guys thought about multi-site? Is that something that you guys are... Uh, we have, um, but right now we're not at that point. Um, we're we're kind of seeing... This is probably our fourth year with the doing the, the more uh, contemporary type style service. We actually do that in the gym. We've redesigned our gym. We've put up, you know, sound and lighting and all this stuff. Um, and so it is a possibility in the future. But as of right now, we're we're here. We're, we're packing the hill, basically. Gotcha. Gotcha. Great. Um, and so tell me about the project that you brought to the foundry today. Um, it was an interesting one, and uh, we'd love to hear about your challenge or what you're looking forward to right there. Right. So um, we're working on a redesign for a website. Um, we've okay. had the same site for practically five years. Um, I've been through two redesigns here, um, and it's time for the next. Uh, we do a WordPress. We did self-host. We have an amazing uh, connection to the Internet, 100 meg up and down. Um, wow. And... Uh, we do stream our own services, but um, we uh, we're in the middle of a you know like I said just to redo it. Um, we currently use WordPress, um, and we've used that for the past few years. Um, I'm happy with it just because of the ease. If I always I know it's kind of morbid, but I always kind of go in the philosophy. If I get hit by a bus and someone can come in and pick up and go with it, um, um, I and that's kind of how I how I work here. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, we're just trying to figure out, okay, so we have a lot of information up there right now, and I think some of it's relevant, some of it's not. So we're wanting to probably s streamline a lot of things, make it a little bit more appealing, um, and just, you know, freshen it up at the same time. So Great. So top of mind, what's your, like, highest priority question about your redesign? Is it on the technology side? Is it on the content side? Is it, um, it would probably be more content. Um, I know there's a lot of things out there. In the past five years, there's been a lot of things come out. So basically, how, since I'm a one-man show, how would it be easier to get up like events, calendaring? Um, we we do sermons, and I do and encode the podcast, and we put them up on iTunes. Um, but how to maybe streamline some things so that um, you know it doesn't take me five hours a day to you know put up content and renew everything and, and do all that. So um, basically, just to kind of streamline, try to pull everything yeah, together. Yeah. 
So I think um, there's two things that I would first look at, and they're both intertwined. One is I think that you probably need to, and you're probably doing some of it already, is harness either a volunteer team or expand your team. No matter what size it is today, you want to hopefully expand the vision for both the impact and engagement in your community. There's a lot of people in your community, especially with a church your size, that I believe probably could get involved, um, and this might be the way for them to put their faith into action. Uh, so that's the first thing. And volunteers, I think, are key. Like we, I think in ministry, a lot of times we look at some of the core, quote, critical stuff that we're supposed to be taking care of business, and we, we there's this fear to let it go, that when we use, have a close-handed approach to it. Mm -hmm. What we found on our side here um, at, at the church that I, I work at um, in New Jersey um, our church online platform actually have, was coded entirely by volunteer support. Uh, kind of crazy. Uh, we actually decided that off-the-shelf products did not meet our needs, and we needed some tweaks and little things that were contextualized for our community. And so we set out to build a completely online um, streaming service, uh, and, and we did it completely by volunteer support. That's, I think, a best-case scenario where you would uh, imagine that that's something that you need to hire out or need to buy out of the box, etc. It's a critical asset for your ministry operations, and yet we found volunteers to do that. So um, that's, I think, just one thing I just want to see it in your head. Like, we're constantly pushing because um, it's, all, it's, it's not about them helping you. It's more about, as a ministry philosophy, that we're trying to help people put their faith into action and really expand um, that the generosity and the spiritual discipline of giving um, of community and involvement. So that's the first thing. Um, the second, related to that, I think, is in order to make that happen, a lot of times you need to really push the envelope on how much you're systematizing, how much you're formalizing, codifying, and really building those processes. Um, and so, especially in content curation, production, publishing, that's a, a sweet spot for building processes. Um, where, um, from our, again, from another example on our side, um, we've systematized um, for we have like we have nine pastors on staff here. We've systematized the system where we are curating um, the collection and identification of stuff in their social feeds, and then offering up a curated version, a smaller editorial version, that um, are suggestions for our pastors for um, engagement for so high capacity volunteers, new people to each campus and ministry. Uh, like pastoral care issues, um, high capacity um, supporters and donors to to the ministries. Those are all identified, and then uh, they're monitored in their personal social feeds, and we curate all that kind of systematiz systematization allows that to happen on a, a, a broad scale. And I think it's a good use of using technology to scale the personal relationships. We're not substituting the actual personal interaction, but what we're doing is we're helping. Uh, get rid of all that friction of going through the feeds, etc. So same thing here in gathering and curating and publishing content. Um, there's definitely things such as, I don't know if you know of a tool called sweetprocess.com, which is a great tool to look at. Um, that allows you to literally document all the steps possible um, that you need for any given task, uh, and then add screen sharing videos, narration, all, the, all that kind of stuff, right? It's a reminder... Um, it just it reminds me of this story that, um, you know, airline pilots, commercial airline pilots, they fly the same equipment every single day, eight, you know, day in, day out. Um, even the veteran ones that have been flying for decades, if you look at any pilot, they have a checklist that they go through before they take off, and they literally go through checklists, right? So it checklist and systematizing allows you to have consistency, uh, and applying that consistency of actions across the board. Um, another one for... Um, I guess for your website project to gather content is, um, I believe it's called gathercontent.com, I believe. Okay. I'm going to look it up right now. Um, it's, a, it's a great platform to um, take your entire site map and then go to all the other constituents out there and then produce great quality content because you're able to uh, plan, organize, and collaborate with the right stakeholders um, with gathering all the appropriate content even before you load it into the CMS system. So even before you do this new website launch, 
you can start on the editorial content pieces. So gathercontent.com is a great tool that I recommend. Okay. Um, we're using a couple client projects, um, and it's well received. It's very easy to organize, and um, you be the kind of like the uh, circus ringleader uh, with all the different departments and stakeholders. So those are two places that I would say at the very beginning um, you need to look at. Um, for your production flow, your content flow, your workflow for um, production of, of video content, production of um, social content, and then even tutorial content for your actual main website. Okay. Um, in terms of your actual site, so if we're going to the actual secondbaptist.org, I don't know, Eric, if you want to share your screen on your side so that maybe the viewers can watch and see um, across your Google Plus feed for the Hangout. Um, great. So um, I guess maybe can you share with us some of the things that you're thinking about in terms of content? Is there, I, I have, uh, I'd say, communications framework that I'd love to share with you Yeah. Um, to walk through that on a just very high level that you can use to drill down in each section. But um, can you share with me, I guess, what the intent of your either current or your future version? What what what's your main objective of the site? Can you verbalize it or articulate that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, for one, we want to get rid of a lot of stuff, a lot of fluff that's out there that we really don't need, mm. um, because we want the people to be engaged to actually come in and and experience it instead of us just hanging everything out there. Um, right. That's one of the biggest things that I've said over the years. Like, guys, we we got to take some of this down because they've got to come in and experience it. If we give it all to them now, there's no need for them to come in. Um, but but the biggest thing is just to make it, um, I guess, just a little more friendly. Because when you come here, I mean, we, we do have our worship times at the top. Um, we do have the address, and we've got that to where you click on it, and it does take you to you know Google Maps. Um, and we do have the latest sermons. But just like how to get not really orientation, but, you know, where would you put this stuff? I know that we want to engage more guests um, and how to, you know, how to going to do that. Um, the, the, yeah. the big thing in the middle, we use Fellowship One, just started that at the beginning of the year, um, and that helps us out with a lot of stuff. Um, but like I said before, we uh, our huge purpose here is missions, so we want, we'd like to get our events up here, but, you know, wh where would we do that? Um, like I was sharing with you before, I read the the Jonathan Mann, you know, the Rethinking Your Church website strategy, and he was saying a lot of stuff about, you know, you don't want your visitors to come in and have to click through stuff. You want to put it on yep. the front page so it's easy access. Well, <laughs> whoops, everything that we have to do here, you got to click. So, uh, you know, potentially we need to work on that. Yeah, I think you're on the right track. I, you know, one of the things that I would say, ask is... Um, is it clear to your team or whoever, if it's you at the helm for the website, is it crystal clear in your mind who the primary audience is? And if it is the new visitor, the person who has not walked into your church, um, are you able to look at all your content through that lens and reimagine it? So that's the first thing. Sure. Um, the second thing is I would look at, because you have an existing site, and actually because you have a decent-sized community, probably a decent amount of visibility in your uh, community, um, have you looked at the analytics to see what is actually being used? Yes, we have. Um, we have. I have. Uh, the uh, <laughs> funny thing is the pastor's blog is like, I mean, it's almost probably 90%. Everybody goes directly to the pastor's blog. They want to see what he has to say. Right. Um, so that's like the main thing. The, the, the second thing is, is the sermons. Okay. Which is uh, nice, but that has nothing to do with the church. <laughs> right, right. With the exception of the sermons. But, I mean, you know, the pastor's blog is more of a, you know, social thing. So um, we want to try to direct them to maybe, hey, this is what's going on this week, um, like events. I mean, we, we have, you know, you can see at the bottom, it's kind of upcoming events. Um, I've never been really happy with that. Um, it's just kind of plain. <laughs> gotcha. 
Well, I want to make, make a reminder that um, we need to go. If you truly are going to be missional, we have to get out of this uh, old ABC mind for, uh, mindset. I don't know if you've heard of the ABC, right? It's, it's all about being attractional, um, you know, come to me, 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 me. It's all about be the building, right? Everything's about every, something happening at the building. And for yeah. me, is cashola. Give me money, money, money. Um, we have to break those barriers. Um, and so I would say that in this day and age, um, I think we do have to recognize that the, what the people are signaling here is by looking at the sermons and looking at the blog. And um, it's not, I don't think that's surprising. Um, I think there was a study, and I don't, it's not that recent, but there was an old study where the number one traffic page on any given church website is the, is the pastor's bio. Uh, because people want to know who is leading the organization. They want to know, understand the profile of the person. They want to understand everything um, because that that permeates the culture and really flavors you know, what the ministry is about. Um, so this, the, the pastor's bio today I think has been replaced by the blog because the blog is actually an even more um, personalized glimpse of who that person is. Sure. Um, so um, and, and that, I think, is an indication that people really are looking to the church um, in a relational way. And so can you really serve that visitor um, to really help them strengthen that relationship? Um, and this is a sweet spot for what we're doing today with social media and technology, et cetera, that we're able to scale our personal relationships with people by, by the application of technology with social and digital. Um, so. I would I would really take that as a large signal that you're doing something right there that people want to go to your sermon section they want to hear what your pastor has to preach on um, you know whether it be um, you know I, I guess you have audio I don't do you have I, it doesn't look like you have video uh, preaching no, yet. No, uh, we cut that down because we we used to self host that and you know to cut down the latencies and, you know, yeah, yeah. yeah so we just did audio. Should I yeah. go back to video? Well, I, you know, repurposing and, and uh, multiple uh, mediums is going to increase your reach. Um, audio is still, in most cases, number one. So when when we proliferate content and you produce a video version and you strip out the audio and do the audio version, and then actually um, I would challenge you to try to actually transcribe the, the audio and produce PDF downloads um, as well as potentially transcribed versions on the actual site you'll see that it's very surprising. People will actually download the PDFs as well. Um, this isn't just for sermon. This is just for general podcast, audio content, etc. So you'd be surprised. People really prefer different forms of the media. Um, so that's something to, to experiment with. And transcription is very cheap these days, right? You can go to the Odesk or Elance and find transcription services that are very accurate. Um, and you can even find transcribers that are not literal but actually take out the ums and ahs and actually will string sentences together to make them, um, you know, uh, readable sure. uh, and then reformat them. So that that's something that I would test out. Um, it's one of those low-hanging fruits that um, you don't need to get perfect. Uh, test out on a limited basis. Maybe you select some of your most popular sermon series on the web that for in terms of downloads and, and listeners sure. um, and provide PDF transcripts of those. Like we say, version one is better than version none, right? So you, it's bias for action and, and see how that goes. But yeah, I think that the sermons as well as blogs, I think, is two separate places. And just you know, specific tactical feedback there, even on the blog side, um, as well as the site overall. Again, in terms of relationship, there isn't any capture device that allows me to give you permission to speak to me in what still today is the killer app, and that's email. Um, mm. It's not Twitter, it's not Facebook, etc. Is that if you if you live in someone's email inbox in a permission-based way, you're not spamming them, um, then you still are top of mind. Um, it's, it's unparalleled access to their daily lives. So even here on your blog post, you have the last 20 blog posts on the John 316 blog, but there isn't anywhere to subscribe. There's no call to actions at the end of every single blog post. Um, so that that's something in terms of content marketing is kind of like, hey, this is a, definitely a place for you to up your game, because the the more um, people you have in your list, the better uh, you know you have another tool, a lever, to reach them where they are. 
Um, that's an opportunity for cross promotion. It's an opportunity to expose them to other parts of your ministry. It's definitely something that I would encourage. Email marketing today has um, really become sophisticated in that you're allowed to um, automate the conversations and also nurture um, the, the, the relationships so that they actually can come to a point of decision that says, hey, we're actually going to visit uh, this church on a Sunday. So what do you mean by that? Do you mean like little chip sort of thing where you would... Yeah, there's different um, different um, email platforms out there. MailChimp is definitely one of the options that allows you to do the automation work and build okay. autoresponders. Okay. Um, I'll give you a very tactical, practical uh, thing. Um, our, on my church's website, we have um, you know video sermons that you can download, you can download the audio, etc. Um, any given sermon that we throw up onto iTunes and our website can go from anywhere from 5,000 to 20,000 downloads in that first month alone that we release it, right? Um, and so the question is, what do you do with that traffic? Um, they're, 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 I like to call them drive-by traffic. It's kind of like you have a store. You allow people to come into your store, look around, and then leave. You have no idea. It might be a great day. You might have 1,000 people walk into your store, but they leave at the end of the day, and, and after, when you're closing the door at the end of the night, what do you have to show for it? Right? How do you get them to come back? You have no way, because you have no idea who came into your store. Um, imagine if you had an email list, a way to contact every single one of them and let them know that actually tomorrow everything's 90% off. Or imagine tomorrow you have a special you know, guest artisan or some event or something that's of value to them. There's no way to tell them. Um, and so um, you want to have some mechanism to do that. So for our video pages, if they're on our video pages consuming our video sermons, I know that that's something that they are interested in. And so right now I've asked our team to identify what the top five most downloaded sermon series are historically on our site. So they're identifying that now. And then now we're building an email autoresponder that basically just gives them a mini tour. It's probably going to be those five series, so links to those five series, but then it's probably going to have an intro and then probably a, a more or two at the end to introduce them to both our live church online services five times a week, but also if they're in the New Jersey metro area, visit one of our four campuses and, and some, some content like that. Um, that's going to be offered on every single video um, page. Um, so if you're a first-time visitor to our site, you're consuming one of our on-demand sermons, imagine being able to be offered, hey, did you like this sermon? Did this speak? Did you resonate with this message? Well, sure. um, I'd love to give you five, our top five most popular sermon, most impactful sermon messages um, in our archive. Sign up here, and then they go into this video tour. Okay. Right. So then now you're living in their inbox long after they left because it's not... Um, you know, they didn't find their site. Say they found our site on um, a Google search, right? And it, it, you know, they might not remember our website long after they left. Uh, sure. They might get busy, etc. So this is a way to to utilize that first touch, build that permission-based relationship, and continue that relationship down the road. Okay. And that that sense of email audience autom autom uh, automation. Um, isn't just for your website. I would say that you need to think about, um, you know, offline. How do you integrate that with first-time visitors? Um, so at our church, first-time visitors um, are, uh, if they fill out a connection card, then get an email from uh, the campus pastor or someone from the team. There's a, this whole automated series um, that, in a very, very um, low pressure way introduces them to the DNA, core values, beliefs of our church, and invites them to con continue to come back. Same thing with first-time givers. First-time givers is a great opportunity to reinforce um, the opportunity to speak to them because they believe in your mission, they believe in what you're doing in the community, um, they understand that this is part of their spiritual discipline to um, offer uh, and tithe, um, and so you want to encourage that, acknowledge that, and then share with them all the things that the ministry is doing that wouldn't be possible without uh, supporters like themselves, right? So you want to reinforce that um, relationship with donors, especially first-time donors. Cool. Good. So those are the two, you know, things that you can look out for. I gotcha. think going back strategically overall, um, again, to the question of who your website serves, 
mm -hmm. um, is really to look in the lens of the that that visitor. Is this really um, are, is your content geared toward people who are currently members of your church, or is it geared to someone who's never been to church dr or just driven by a church several times and think about you know what's happening inside that building, right? That mammoth building that I know thousands of people go to every week. Mm -hmm. What's inside that thing? Um, so you can just imagine from that, that point of view, uh, what would serve their need? How do you get rid of the black box or the black hole um, for them to really start to think about, okay, this might be the week that I actually check out this church. Um, so photography, multimedia, things showing the vibrant life of your church I think is probably helpful. Um, messaging about you know who you are and um, in a recent website project we did, we actually literally had a um, button in the top nav that says skeptics welcome. Mm. Um, another one is who is Jesus mm -hmm. um, and really trying to communicate that um, in a very conversational manner uh, because the website is it's no longer a brochure it's a it's a conversation that you're having for people right so we like to say um, put down your megaphone and take up the telephone stop mm -hmm. broadcasting and you're yelling at people um, and start thinking about it as a telephone conversation, give and take. Make sense? Yes, absolutely. That's awesome. So there's this great framework I'd love to show you that we've been using with um, a lot of projects, um, um, organizations I'm partnering with that have been it's been very successful, uh, very useful. Um, first of all, it's it's called SWAT. W uh, sorry, S W A T, not SWAT analysis as in S W O T. If this is a communications framework I've developed over the last 15 years. It really is helpful for a lot of organizations like yourself. So the first letter S stands for sub-audience. Right? So in any communications product project, we typically define an audience. But in our work, we found out that that's too generic and we need to drill down. When things go awry and the project doesn't go as planned, um, a lot of times we go back and look at, you know what, it was just too broad, too generic. Um, so you really need to niche down and be very specific. It's kind of like when you preach, uh, a lot of preachers you'll talk to, they'll say, when I assemble a sermon um, and I go through my prep, I'm actually thinking in my head about this specific couple. I, I know where they sit every week or I know their names and I know that family. I want this message to speak directly into their lives. Now there's a halo effect that everyone else in the room benefits, but the uh, really effective communicators narrow down, niche down, has laser targeted focus as to who they're specifically talking to. And that's where this idea of the SWAT uh, framework came into place, is that you want to be laser targeted focused in and out. You want to be able to know exactly who you're speaking to. So you want to niche down and find out who your sub audience is. So who in your community are you really trying to reach? Is it people who've been to church before? Or is it people who've never had an experience with church before? Um, of the people that have been to church, is it people who are, you know, over church or um, burnt out Catholics? Is it um, people who have um, grown up in the church but then disappeared after college? You really have to conceptualize exactly who that priority of that sub audience is. Pick one or two, go deep, um, and don't feel like there's a fear that you're going to miss this, the whole other broad spectrum. I'm telling you, there's a halo effect that you'll get to them as well. But to be effective, niche down and, and, and define that sub-audience. And then second is, for that sub-audience, you want to define hashtag win. That's the W. So what is the win? Not for you as an organization, for them. You have to sit in their shoes and really think about it. Because um, I have this great talk that, that says, you're talking to the wrong you. Typically when you know, we diagnose the email newsletters that go out for an organization, typically they're talking to themselves. They're serving themselves as the organization, the publisher of the newsletter. They're not, they're not really being mindful and being, trying to be of utmost value to you, the reader of the newsletter, right? So same thing with your, um, all your messaging communications. Stop thinking about yourself and really define the win for that sub-audience. Because if you can meet that sub audience's win, a success, when they're high fiving you because they got what they needed, hey, that's when you, me, and Eric can go out for a two hour lunch or call it the day and go to the golf range, right? Because um, at the end of the day, if we succeed by fulfilling exactly what they need, not what I 
and we need, then we have a seat at the table, we become relevant, and then we're in conversation and, and actually they take us seriously. Uh, so that's the win. So again, going back to the sub-audience example, maybe it is um, families, young families that you want to uh, uh, engage with. Maybe it's the mother in the family. Maybe it's the mother with two kids in the family. Uh, maybe it is the mother with two kids with probably a toddler in preschool, not yet in kindergarten, and maybe one in the elementary age where they're starting to creep up into the age of third grade, fourth grade, where you seriously want to have faith discussions um, and that they want to ensure that they expose their family as a unit to a healthy environment, right? So if that's a sub-niche, then the information you're going to provide to them on your website is going to need to reflect that, hey, there are other peer families like that, so you want to show photography, video, your testimonials are going to be curated to make sure that you have not just men, but you actually have women or even children on the site, right? So you can start to think about um, that that bleeds into all the other decisions once you define who your sub-audience is and what the win is for them. Okay. The next one is A, is the activities, right? So that's going to determine what activities that you're going to do in order to define the win. So again, taking that example, if it is mothers with a preschooler and um, an elementary school kid. So you know for a fact that maybe in the middle of the day is their sweet spot, right? Kind of like the soap opera time, right? Maybe that's the sweet spot for having informational events or something gatherings or something that you can attract them to. Maybe that's where you rev up a women's ministry geared at young early parenting um, that talks to them, that's midweek, during the day, or maybe it's right after drop-off, after they drop off at preschool and at, at elementary school, maybe that's the sweet spot of the day where you really never thought about that. Maybe it's something that you host live, just like a, like an office hours, like a check-in, like something that's conversation. If the, if the pastor's blog is that popular in your community, imagine having a talk with the pastor, a coffee with the pastor recurring thing that happens every Monday morning or every Tuesday morning right after drop-off. So maybe... 9 o'clock, 9.30-ish, um, that might be something that might be appealing. I don't know. That's, you know, in terms of brainstorming, yeah. that allows you to start to think about your platform in different ways that you never thought of because you're defining from the wind from their point. Maybe it's late at night after the kids go to bed. So the kids go to bed, put them down to bed. Maybe you, you try to get them to start to get them to bed at 8, 8.30. Maybe they finally get to bed at 9 o'clock. You know what I mean? Like, And so maybe at 9, 9.30 at night, that's when you start to produce, uh, you, you have a streaming service. So maybe you have some live conversations, or it's pre-recorded stuff that you have live moderated chats for parents, et cetera. Right? So you can start to think of what type of activities it is for mothers um, of families that have that type of age. Um, so uh, on Sundays, even, um, that starts to craft what type of content you're producing. Um, is it even on the pastor blog. So if he's talking to that audience, is it trying to find out what are the resources available for parents? Um, a lot of parents have guilt because they know that they should be doing stuff with their children, but they feel under-equipped, ill-equipped with having those faith conversations. So maybe it is having more of those content pieces from your pastor speaking to them and really giving them some um, advice of how to integrate on a practical basis. Um, so you can see how editorially um, that type of thing is. And, and that's, that speaks to the last letter of the framework, T. That's the tactics and technology. So once you determine the sub-audience, you define the win from their perspective, what they want out of this relationship and why they're looking to you. Then that will determine the activities, right? So maybe it is partnering with them to get them great parenting advice. Maybe it's specifically, explicitly about how to introduce those faith conversations or those tools, and what am I supposed to be doing as a parent to ensure that they have a relationship with Jesus by the time they, they um, leave my nest, right? Um, then the tactic of technology then determines, okay, then that means in our blog, we need to have some dedicated seasons of content for that. Maybe it is live events on our website. Maybe it's resources where you actually curate a whole section of um, book reviews, sermons, articles, blog posts, and you curate a whole section 
for young parents and with that, you know, the mother in mind. Mm -hmm. Make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So SWOT really allows you to start to think about your content and your platform in a different way. It, from our experience, it actually empowers you and gives you freedom to think outside the box and really be um, not just creative, but much more relevant to that end audience in a way that they have they don't see anywhere else. It makes them pause and take notice and say, "Wow, this church is different. They're actually speaking to my needs, my wins." Um, and if they have some of that, then I'm able to join a community of like-minded individuals that explore a relationship of Jesus further. And you know what? Dynamically, I think it gets to the point where you're saying. A relationship of Jesus includes my life as a mother, includes my life as um, a family member, right? So wherever they are in their circumstances, it starts to resonate and empower them to think of their faith in different ways. It's no longer, um, my faith is no longer about sit and soak, go sit in a pew, and it's just on Sundays, but it brings this vibrancy and this dynamic element that says, hey, my faith life is about being plugged into community with others, and it it it, it um, affirms who I am, where I am, what what I've what I'm doing vocationally. Whether it's um, being a house um, housewife and a um, a mother to my children, or it's working outside my home, um, you start to really think about faith in different ways. Sure. Yeah. Hopefully that's helpful. Any questions? Or what does that spark in your mind for? Second Baptist in particular, we can start to go from there. Well, that's great. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm waiting. I'm, I'm gathering all this information, and I get to go to the executive staff and talk to them about, you know, what's our focus, what's our target, and then go over some of these things. I've been writing frivolously here, yeah. as you can see, um, and just kind of go over some of these, you know, topics. You know, um, we have a lot of uh, single mothers that come here. Um, we've got a lot of, you know, how we're going to engage them. Now, on, on <clears throat> excuse me, on a more technical level, you gave some examples of like like live events, chat, chatting. Yeah. You know, maybe like, can you give me like specific software or or like what do you guys use for for stuff like that? Yeah, so I think uh, first of all, software and platforms are evolving like crazy. So you got to spend some time always checking out new things. Um, so one of the things that uh, we are looking at, and I've done it in some client aspects. I haven't done it in the church yet, but we're looking at it as automated webinars. Okay, and so this is all about again uh, peeling back the curtain and giving everybody a peek inside before they get there, right? So the the premise is that uh, your website is the new front door to your church, right? People check out your website before they go to your church door, and so what you want to do is use that opportunity to serve that sub audience, whoever you're targeting, to give them a peek inside the church building per se. Um, as to uh, so that it removes um, any awkwardness, any um, hesitation, anxiety, right? So um, I'll give you one quick example. Um, so we have live um, services every week um, where we have moderated chat. There's it's five times a week. Uh, church online worship services. I'm the church online pastor, but I I like to bring typically one of the campus pastors, one of our four physical location campus pastors on, on camera with me so that, and we have chat and banter on, on uh, during the service. The whole purpose there is to expose who they're physically going to meet when they walk into the church building. Can you imagine going into a business or building where you don't know who's in there versus if you already know who they are, you've heard them speak, you actually know how quirky and clumsy and that they're, they're real humans too, um, that you might be able to relate to them. That just lowers the bar for someone to make the decision to walk inside your church building. It's one of the reasons why blogging is so helpful. But video and conversations and anything you can do to that effect really helps. Another one is physical tours of the, the physical plant that you're asking them to walk into. So do you have areas of the site that really help expose them, literally, where is my toddler in preschool going to be during the service? Where is that elementary school? That's the mother's concern. How far am I going to have to leave my child right, for the first week? My child might have separation anxiety, or I myself as a mother is just a hyper-helicopter mom. And so um, 
I might want to know literally, is it like in another building? Is it, you know, just next door? Is it, do you have a baby cry room with a bulletproof glass, right, in the back of the room where I can physically be with my baby and child the whole time? Like, they, you're conjuring up imagination unnecessarily. So how do you dispel that? Well, why not to give them the best possible solution is give them some tours, and you can produce a nice series of videos to be able to do that. One of the things that we do on climb projects is um, we harness FAQs. So we get everyone into a room and produce not the boring standard one dozen, two dozen FAQs. What I would do is I would come into a, a room with you, we would whiteboard, um, and challenge you guys to come up with 300 FAQs. Hmm. Everyone was like, eyes open up at that point. Are you kidding me? You're talking, you know why? Because by the time you get to the 100th FAQ, the 200th FAQ, you're no longer asking, so where's the parking lot? What is their service times? It's literally asking, I have a child that has special needs or is autistic. Can you accommodate that? And if so, what does that space look like? Or what's your volunteer training for special needs children? Right? You literally get to that type of point. I have a child that has separation anxiety. It's going through a phase at this point. Am I allowed to sit in with them during their children's services? Right? And so you can literally start to answer those things. Um, so what we do is we produce hundreds of FAQ. Right? That's the idea. And then what you do is you get a collection of people from across your, I mean, you've got, I'm sure you have a big staff, um, volunteers as well, right? Get a bunch of them, schedule them. Um, what we typically do is you block out a conference room or something like that, and then you video every single FAQ. Mm -hmm. So imagine having a battery of 300, 400 FAQs in a YouTube channel, and YouTube is your number two search engine today, right? Okay. Um, and, um, and searches are task-oriented. Once they start, and you already have people searching already for uh, Second Baptist Church, you know, um, seventh grade program, middle schoolers. You have, um, you know, I'm, I'm broke, you know, do these guys give out grants or something. But no, we do have Dave Ramsey's FPU, and we've helped hundreds of people erase their debt, right? You have answers like that I can see, I can also already imagine, that you're going to be able to get to those nitty-gritty fringe type of, we call them long-tail FAQs, right? Um, that are meaningful in really battling and overcoming that inertia for someone to walk into your building. It takes a lot to actually make the commitment. If I don't know anybody in your church, and I don't even have someone if I'm not married or if I'm a partner, to actually come alone to your church is a big decision. It's risky, right? Um, so we want to do everything possible to lower the bar. So even though just that project alone, the FAQ video project, is a way to win search and rankings. Yeah. It's a way to actually get a lot of people involved. Um, it's a great way to reward high-capacity volunteers. Give them some visibility because for volunteer management, there's two things. There's recognition, right? Do you understand? And appreciation. Mm -hmm. So appreciation is thanking them, being where they are, and really giving them the opportunity to understand that they're fulfilling the mission that Christ has given to your ministry, and they're part of the solution. Without them, we wouldn't be able to happen. But then there's a second part of recognition of volunteers. That's publicly giving them some sort of um, accolade to give a signal to them that they're important. And this is a great project where you can bring them into a room, have them record a couple of FAQ videos that are short, concise, um, and then it's part of the mosaic that you're displaying on your YouTube channel and your blog and your website that says this person is a part of who we are as a church. It's a public statement that is indirect, but oh so powerful for the person who's being recorded, but also for the people who are looking at the smattering of different people that are across your entire uh, three, four hundred FAQ videos. Sure. Right? Yeah. So that's a very, I think, low-hanging fruit, low-cost way that any church leader that's you know, watching this um, video piece can execute in the next 30 to 90 days. Sure. And it doesn't need to be, I'm sure you have a video team, you can be, you know, polish it up, do the intro, the outro, and you produce them. But in a very, you know, you, you can do it, you know, title, you know, fade in every church logo, 
the title of the question on the screen, and then you can have someone literally saying, you know, so um, for our children's ministry, our check-ins are 15 minutes before the service. If it's the first time you've ever been there, you can, you'll can you be presented with forms to fill out with some safety information, or you can download them from our website at this address. Close out, fade out. Right, so literally, that might be the question answering. If what am I going to need to do if, if this is the first time visiting your church with my children, right? And then mm -hmm. you answer that question, and then you close out. Um, right, it's a simple project. This, you know, it's one of those things where people with a bias for action and that are detail oriented are rewarded. They get the prize, right? Mm -hmm. so it's a matter of execution. Uh, but that I think is again something that you're able to use that SWAT to really figure out what are the answers, what's the win that I can address. And here the tactic technology is FAQ, um, and the tactic the technology really speaks to, hey, let's get it onto our blog, let's get it onto our video, um, and then you can create an email autoresponder that says, hey, are you a, a first, you know, are you, um, are you a, a parent of uh, kids in the elementary school or toddlers? Um, you know, sign up here, and we'll send you the top ten questions that we get asked from people just like you. And then you send them one video every couple of days uh, with a note from the, uh, the children's pastor or people from that ministry, etc. Right. So that's another way to repurpose. Um, another one is the YouTube channel, Vimeo. You want to syndicate to all the video sharing platforms out there. Okay. Yeah, we've really started using Vimeo, so that's good. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right, excellent, man. So it's it's a radical change and departure for how we plan for our content now. Mm -hmm. um, it's really looking at front page and said, hey, if I am that stranger, if I am that outsider, what am I doing a Google search for? What am I trying to get done? Mm -hmm. Am I trying to really figure out, you know, um, you know, looking at your website right now? Um, am, Honestly, am I really trying to figure out how to give? Is that a priority? Is that one of the top five, six things the priority? Um, are you asking a first-time, you know, um, first-time visitor to really talk about giving, or maybe it's talking about generosity, and there that piece not talks about, um, you know, literally how to give online and your, you know, um, ECFA statement, etc., like that. Maybe it's talking about. Um, your commitment as a church to be a tithing church and that we do, we ourselves believe that we're called to um, give first fruits back in this, in this manner and then give some examples and invite people on that journey. And one of the things that we ask, uh, we think that's important for uh, the people in the community is to do offering tithing. And maybe that's where you link to sermon messages where your pastor articulates um, you know the the ministry vision for how offering operates in that manner. Cool. Writing. <laughs> so that okay. that's the tip of the iceberg, but I, hopefully that gives you um, some handles to hold on to and take yeah, and really you can do that with every ministry front, obviously, and figure out in the context of the lens of your website. What do they need to use the website for to, to reach the win for each of the sub-audiences? Sub Not everything needs to belong on the website. Sure. Absolutely. I agree. Kenny I, right. love, Kenny, I love how you've taken a question about how to redesign a website, and instead of giving the answer that everyone would expect, you know, put a sign up on the left, move the menu down, get above the fold. Instead, what you're saying is, this is how you need to rethink your content. This is how you need to curate things. Organize yeah. that, set your priorities, and then build your frame around that. Yeah. Brilliant, yeah. Kenny. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, last, the last thing I'll uh, leave you with uh, as we close the, this out is I'll give you another practical tube, tool, and it's called verifyapp.com. It's a tool by the group called Verb. Um, they've got a bunch of great tools that you, as an IT guy, would geek out on. Um, but Verify App is a great tool that allows you to look at your current website um, and just do user testing. And so you plug in the URL of the page, and then they have, they have totally different types of tests, click tests, um, annotation tests. You can do all these different types of things, A-B testing, et cetera, um, to really figure out what people are looking at your page and evaluating it as, what they think the next step really is, 
Um, it's eye-opening. You'll be surprised at the responses you get. And so that's a, that's a tool we use heavily in defining our content, etc. It's also something that you should use with your current site pages to mm -hmm. really learn what they find valuable on the page right now. Okay. Excellent. All right. Thank you so much. Well, hopefully you got some practical things to go off on. Um, I would say, um, Eric, we're going to post this, and you know, we'll monitor the comments in there, and that anybody else wants to jump in. I, one of the the dreams of this is that it's not just a conversation between us, but that other people pile on and share their experiences. So, in the comments below this post, I would I would love to see Eric a, a vibrant conversation that we um, start to you know circle around Second Baptist and and really. Um, try to um, help him as a sounding board and uh, really to encourage Sam on his on his mission right now. I completely agree, and I, I'm guessing that when this gets posted, that Sam will probably watch it again because there was so much information, Kenny. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thanks for being the guinea pig and uh, being in the hot seat today, and we'd love to have an update when you get to even the interim port of wireframes or sitemap, et cetera, maybe we can check back in and um, share what's going on and, and see the progress. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that would be amazing, Sam. Thank you. Like like Kenny said, thank you for being the guinea pig in this, and we definitely want to keep getting updates on this, and eventually we'll have a link and a, a screen capture yeah. of the after. Yeah, yeah, that'd be nice, before and after. <laughs>